Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is where we're going to be today. When Spain had extended their conquest to the ends of the then known world, controlled both sides of the Mediterranean Sea at the Straits of Gibraltar where the, the fabled pillars of Hercules were, on their coins they proudly pictured the pillars framing a scroll. And on the inside of that scroll written in Latin were these words, Ne plus ultra. Ne plus ultra. No more beyond. In their mind, they had conquered and found the ends of the earth. But in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And he discovered an entire new world. And the proud nation of Spain, they admitted their ignorance. And they struck the negative ne from their coinage, only leaving plus ultra. More beyond. The change serves as a handy reminder of what is needed in the spiritual landscape of the world around us, men and women, because so many live with the stifling delusion that there is no more beyond. No more beyond. No more beyond their earthly wants, no more beyond their earthly needs, uh, no more beyond their job, their hobbies, their family, no more beyond this life. But plus ultra, more beyond, perfectly describes the content of 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 10, where Paul writes of the longing of a disciple maker. Paul is laying his heart out in this letter and showing us uh, what it takes to be a true, genuine, sincere disciple maker, somebody who is about the business of encouraging others and giving them, sharing with them the hope of Christ and helping them to grow. And so let's read his words here, 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. I want to read the whole chunk here together. We're only going to cover the first five verses today, but I want you to see the full context where he says this, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. And so we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. And so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what He has done in the body, whether good or bad evil. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for everything we've been able to experience thus far in the service together. Even just the friendly greetings and conversation and encouragement and simple catching up with people as to what's gone on in their week. Lord, we're thankful. I know many just in quick conversations, they're thankful to be able to be here because it was a late night, a long night, different circumstances and things going on in families. But we're thankful to be able to gather here today. We're thankful that we could sing so sincerely about our Savior this morning and remember His friendship and His care and compassion. And now we pray Your blessing as we consider the truth of Your Word. May it not be a word that we easily forget, but may it be something that drives deep, becomes foundational for us as we consider our life in following Jesus. And it is in His name we pray. Amen. In verse 1, Paul unleashes a series of metaphors uh, that can really be summed up like this. Right now, he says, we live in this, this temporary tent that's being dismantled, or some actually go as far as saying it's just collapsing. It's a tent that's falling apart. But in Christ, we look forward to a permanent, eternal structure. And when you think about his audience, those in the Roman world, they knew what it was to live in tents. 
Many of them were traveling uh, salesmen, uh, and so they would set up at markets. Some of them were traveling athletes, and so they would set up outside of the different centers that they would compete and have competitions. Roman soldiers certainly knew what it was to, to be in a tent and to live that life, but they also knew, in contrast, of the permanence of some pretty amazing structures. The Colosseum, which a lot of it still stands today, 70 AD, they knew how to build structures that could last. And so they saw both sides of this instance. So the contrast Paul wants us to understand is something that's temporary versus something that's permanent. Something that's insecure versus something that's secure. Something that's weak versus something that's strong. Something that's cloth or leather versus something that's stone and going to remain. Now, I desperately want to like camping. As a kid, I, I, I enjoyed setting up my tent, backyard, setting up my tent behind my aunt's house in their field in the, the woods back there and camping out with my friends. I loved the fire. I loved doing that stuff. But every time I've tried as an adult, it's been rough, I'll tell you. Uh, years ago, we asked for Christmas if somebody would give us a, a tent so we could do this thing as a family, and I thought, yeah, this is going to be good for us. And uh, mom and dad bought us the tent. Our first camping trip with them was at Roaring River. It was the middle of summer. It was like July 3rd, that kind of July 4th-ish time frame. And, and uh, there was a cold front that came through that, that year. It was the weirdest thing. It dropped down into maybe the upper 30s at night. We, had to, we were freezing to death the first night. We were finding anything we could. The next day, we had to go to Cassville and buy sleeping bags in the middle of the summer. And then at Roaring River, you know, they've got the, wah, the siren that goes off at like 5 o'clock to tell the guys they can go fish. And so that was kind of annoying. But what we tried uh, next time, we, it was a couple years later, we were going to go to Indian Cave State Park up in the, the, the southeast corner of Nebraska. And it was basically like we set that tent up just outside the gates of hell. It was hot. <laughs> It was terrible. And the mosquitoes, they ate us alive for like two days. It was miserable. We actually cut a day off of the front end because of storms that had come through. And so I was thanking God for that. It was rough. Had a dead battery. Me and dad had to drive like an hour to a town to get a battery and come back and put it in the van. And uh, we, we've had a couple of okay experiences, but it's rough sleeping in the tents. They remind me of the supremacy of my climate-controlled, um, non-bug-infested, and where my bed house, where my bed dwells house, where I can go and sleep. Uh, the permanence of a home is wonderful. And so Paul, who happens to be a tent maker by trade, he compares living in this body to living in a tent. It's something temporary. Some suppose it's illusion here, and I like to point these things out so you can see Paul's deep roots in the Old Testament to Isaiah 38 verse 12, which reads, my dwelling is plucked up and removed from me like a shepherd's tent. Paul is thinking about that particular passage. He knows the Corinthians who he's writing to. They're familiar with the ideas of the resurrection and the, this body and the, the permanent body that we'll receive because he, he's already written to them about this in his first letter. And we're gonna, we're gonna read that together here. First Corinthians, if you will turn with me, uh, chapter 15. Actually, I think it may be on the screen behind me. I have that one on here. First Corinthians 15, you can turn if you'd like and follow along or you can follow along on the screen. I just wanna cover some of what Paul has shared with them because he's building on the context that he's already laid for them. First Corinthians 15, I'm gonna start in verse 35. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Oh, you foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that it is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans and another for animals and another for birds and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There's one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For the stars differ in the stars, in, uh, from stars in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not 
the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a, a man of dust, and the second is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also those who are of the dust, and as the man of heaven, so also those who are of the heavens. Just as we have been born the image of man, also, uh, man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Paul goes on in verse 50 to say, I tell you this, brothers, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body, he says, must put on imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And because of this, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. So here in 1 Corinthians 15, which I know there's a lot there. We got a whole other series you can go back and you could listen to on that. But here in 1 Corinthians and in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul writes that he knows the resurrection to be true. He knows it to be true. For Paul, for Paul this isn't just about some logical or, or reasonable argument that he's put together. It's very personal for him. How's that? Because he personally met the resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus. He has seen the proof of resurrection eye to eye, face to face. And he's trying to convey that to the Corinthians. Before we move on, I, I want to make sure we're clear on a couple of points here regarding resurrection. A, a biblical view of the resurrection means that this mortal body must put on immortality. The same body. Right? Continuity. It's not, a, it's not a new body. It's the same body. It's this mortal body, he says, that will put on what is immortal. This body that I have here will be renewed. Those, those bodies that are buried in cemeteries or ashes or that, that we could think about all over the world, they will be renewed and they will be resurrected. And if Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection, which Scripture claims him to be, and just as his body was raised, our bodies will be raised. And there's even some semblance in there of, of, of who they were. What was Jesus doing uh, when they said, I, I don't know if I'll believe him. Thomas was doubting. And he, he said, look, look, at the, look at the prints in my hand. I love when we sing songs that connect with Scripture that we're looking at together. There's some semblance of who we are in our resurrected bodies. So, this means that people who die do not get new bodies. It's the same. It's the same body that is now put on immortality. That's the, 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 the distinction of the resurrection from many other things. And so we, we don't get new bodies. We don't turn into angels, right? We don't get angels' wings. Angels are a being altogether different, and so when your loved ones die, it's not biblically appropriate to say, oh, they got their wings. No, no, they didn't get their wings. It's not how it works. I realize there are questions about what happens when a person dies. The Thessalonians had questions about this too. See, the, these first century believers, they thought, you know, Jesus is coming back, like tomorrow. And, and when time began to pass and some of them began to pass away and they were dying, they were going, what, what's happening to them? Paul, what's happening? Where are they going? And that's the question. The resurrection of their body is a future event that will coincide with the return of Jesus. So where are they? Well, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's the other promise that we find in Scripture. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. They're in some unembodied state in the presence of Jesus in what we know is heaven. And what are they doing? They're awaiting the resurrection, the renewal, the return of their physical body. They're in heaven 
They're awaiting their final glorification. I'll tell you, if you want to know a little bit more about that, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, chapter 5, I think I've got that in your notes. You can go, you can look there. But this is what Paul believes. This is what Paul believes about the resurrection. This is what every one who believes the gospel of Jesus believes. And so how does that shape the way we live? How does that shape what Paul experiences? Notice his longing, verses two through four. He openly confesses that, that this life in this tent is not desirable. Amen, life in tents is not desirable. I got it. He says, for in this tent we groan. We long, we long to put on that heavenly dwelling. He repeats similar truth in verse four. He says, for, for while we're still in this tent, we groan being burdened, not that, not that we would be unclothed, but we'd be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. I love that last phrase. What is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Note the words he uses to describe life in the body. Groan. Most of us did that getting out of bed this morning. Longing. There's a burden. Life in this fallen world, life in this broken body is full of pain, suffering, difficulty. Tuesday, I decided was a good day for me to start doing some sort of exercise stuff again. And so I just did some, you know, body kind of workouts. 10 lunges in, I could barely walk any longer. And I, I suffered for it for the next three or four days. Faith got to hear about it. Yeah, lunges, lunges kill me. And that's, that's obviously a very small thing. You know, last Sunday, we had the privilege of sitting down with Jim and Sandy Poston. And uh, Jim, Jim was just walking us through some of the injuries, like things from his childhood that he didn't really think about then, that injury, but now he feels it. He feels it in his bones. He feels it in his muscle. Well, Sandy was sharing with us about her brother back in Arizona. He's got Alzheimer's. His wife, Sandy's sister-in-law, she has the upper stages of cancer, and it's not looking good. Guys, it's suffering. It's the pain of living in this tent. It's the groaning that we experience. Most of you know my dad has Parkinson's disease. I see every time I see him, I see something new. I see how it affects him and how it's affecting him, how it's affecting my family. Some of you are grieving the death of friends. Some of you have fought against the temptation and the trials of sin this week so hard it should have been on like pay-per-view, uh, something people pay to watch, like an ultimate fighter championship because you know you were in the war this week. Life in this body is hard, and so Paul rightfully uses words like groan and burden, and we long for something better. Consider what he writes in Romans chapter 8. This will be on the screen behind me as well. Here's what he says, for, for I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. That was what we talked about last week, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, or 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, for the redemption of our bodies, there it is. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what they see? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. See, it's not just us that are groaning. It's all creation that's groaning. It's not just us who are longing for something better. All of creation is longing for something better. And Paul says that something better is on the other side of the resurrection. Which means we don't get there until we move through the suffering and the death following Jesus in suffering. Following Jesus in death. Where what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Kent Hughes tells this story. 
He says, there was a pastor who once received a letter from a nine-year-old girl. And the letter said, dear pastor, I hope to go to heaven someday, but later than sooner. Love, Ellen. Hughes writes, out of the mouth of babes. Ellen speaks for almost everyone. We all want to go to heaven. We want to go later as opposed to sooner. But that's not the way Paul thought, was it? That's not his mentality. Paul hoped to get there sooner rather than later. We'll talk more about that next week. Oddly enough, despite the pain and suffering that's tied up in the tent of this body, we still resist heaven. We still cling tightly to this life and this body. But as Hughes points out, that's not Paul. Paul, Paul points out that's not even creation. Creation is longing for something better. And I, I fear the issue here, the, the struggle for me, for you, for us, that the difference between Paul and us is a genuine belief, a true belief in the resurrection. Our faith in this area is weak. Like Paul and like creation, man, we should be on our, our tippy toes, like straining forward to see this thing, like kids on, on Christmas morning anticipating what's coming or, or a groom or a bride on their wedding day anticipating the celebration of the day. We should long for the coming resurrection because the resurrection is our final hope. It's, it's all we got. This world isn't going to get any better. This world, as we talked about last week, is going to pass away. All we have is the resurrection. The resurrection is what moves us from, we talked about that justification, sanctification, to glorification. To be glorified. In the resurrection, this body is swallowed up by life. So we have covered Paul's longings in 2 and 4, but what about verse 3 right in the middle? There's an interesting structure to what Paul does here. Verse 1 and 5 tend to match a little bit. 2, 4 match, and then you got 3 right in the middle. And he says, if indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. Paul here writes that he longs for the resurrection body so that he's not left naked. There's a couple significant cultural issues that Paul raises that I think we need to address. In, in Greek philosophy, the body, uh, the, the physical world was viewed as a hindrance. It was something that was in the way. The real human was the, the, the spirit or the soul of a person. And so, so if one could get rid of the body, if one could distance themselves from the physical, they could truly live. This was known as Gnosticism. It was all throughout Paul battling this as he writes letters to the different churches. Well, that philosophy flies in the face of the Creator who on the sixth day said, it is very good. Everything that I've made is very good. It flies in the face of the Redeemer who comes and He is making all things new again, leading to the resurrection of the body. That's why the resurrection was such a controversial issue in the day. That's why it was such a controversial issue that Paul had to write to the Corinthians that whole chapter 15 about it and how it worked and, and its, its roots into the Old Testament. That's why when Paul would speak in different settings and he, he would talk about even the cross and that was foolishness to people, but they would listen. But when he would come to the resurrection and talk of the resurrection of the dead, they'd say, oh, Paul, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Resurrection? No way. Well, additionally, there's the use of the word naked here. That carries some cultural baggage too. When you, when you see and you see sculptures or paintings and so forth from, from the Roman era, what do you think of? You think of marble and you think of naked, right? They didn't put clothes on anybody. And they, 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 they didn't do that for their own reasons. They, they, they had everything. They had bathhouses, right? Athletic events, they would compete in the nude, uh, this was just common in their particular culture, and the Jews struggled with that. The Jews struggled to assimilate to that part because the Jews had a different foundational belief about nakedness. It goes all the way back to Genesis, where Adam and Eve saw their nakedness, 
and they were ashamed. They were ashamed. Paul says, I, I don't want to be naked. I don't want to be found that way. I don't want to be ashamed. He says, I don't want to be found shamefully naked. My, my understanding here is Paul, when he says to be found naked, is to be separated from one's bodily life. Paul doesn't want that. He, he doesn't wish to be without his body. Therefore, his hope is in the resurrection. His hope is that his body will clothe him once again, and he will experience that life. Mortal body will be swallowed up with life. All this comes to a head as Paul concludes with the hope or the source of the resurrection. Verse 5. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God who's given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Paul's hope is not in himself. His hope is not in the, the Corinthians and what they might do. Here he clearly states that he who has prepared us for this very thing is God. So that goes back to what he already said in verse 1. Again, those similarities between these verses where he says, we have a building from God. This eternal, this permanent, it's from Him. As he wrote in chapter 4, verse 14, just as God the Father raised Jesus from the dead, He will also raise us. Salvation is God's work from start to finish. It's His mercy, it's His grace. Uh, several years ago, we, we bought our house and included in that offer a, a small down payment, a very small down payment, but a down payment nonetheless. And a down payment acts as a guarantee between you and who you're buying something from that you're serious about this. That this isn't something you're just doing on a whim, that, that it's something that you're serious in following through with this. It's a way saying, I mean business. And Paul says here that the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a guarantee of the coming resurrection. A down payment. God doesn't just say, hey, I, I, I promise you guys that I'm going to come back. No, he says, I'm going to have my spirit indwell you until I come back, until the resurrection. What an incredible promise is made. Ephesians 1, Paul writes this, the Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. The Spirit not only empowers us, but assures us that the work God started, He will finish. What more does He have to give to assure us of the hope we have in the coming resurrection? It's also the assurance we find in Romans chapter 8. Uh, we read a significant portion of Romans chapter 8 just a moment ago. I'm going to pick up where we left off. Paul's beautiful conclusion here. Romans 8 verse 26. After he speaks of the groaning of creation, he says this in verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes with us with groanings that are too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Even when in our groaning we don't know what to groan, the Spirit is groaning for us. Notice verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, to be glorified, in order that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers, and those whom he predestined, he called, and those whom he called, he justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. Amen. So what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? 
Well, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. As it is written, for your sake we're being killed all the day long, regarded as sheep for the slaughter. No. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Notice how Paul concludes this one. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, no powers, no height, no depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Nothing. Death itself. Death is the means to greater life, right? Let's begin our application right there because what hope? <laughs> what hope? I mean, I don't know if there's a more um, encouraging an uplifting passage than Romans chapter 8 as a whole. It's an incredibly beautiful chapter. In our lives, we mess a lot of things up. Home projects, meals, relationships with other people. We mess all sorts of things up, but we cannot mess this up. Nothing, nothing disturbs this. Nothing will mess this up. He doesn't quit on you, so don't quit on him. Don't doubt his faithfulness. Don't doubt his goodness and his kindness and his grace and his mercy. Keep following. Keep slogging through the mire of suffering. Keep sinking into the depths of that J curve where we're just suffering and dying with Jesus. Keep hoping. Keep praying. Keep longing. Keep standing on your tiptoes in anticipation of the coming resurrection. Because resurrection is coming. <laughs> Do you long and groan for it? Do you long and groan for the resurrection? Hughes writes this, he says, do you groan in this body? Longing for your heavenly dwelling? I can say that as my understanding of scriptures has deepened with the years and therefore my experience of the spirit, the more I groan for my heavenly dwelling. And there's this insightful thought by Lewis. It's on your bulletin if you want to read, follow along there. There have been times when I think we do not desire heaven. But more often I find myself wondering whether in our heart of hearts we've ever desired anything else. It's the secret signature of each soul, the incommunicable and unappeasable want. The thing we desired before we met our wives and made our friends and chose our work, which we shall still desire on our deathbeds when the mind no longer knows wife, friend, or work. Here, I think, is our problem, our struggle. The longing is there, but we're constantly trying to fill the longing with some other thing that simply won't satisfy. We, we convince ourselves and we're tempted to think that, that the temporal things of this world will fill that longing and groaning. That more medicine or, or more sports or more money will somehow rid us of the constant burden for the glory that we truly want. The glory of eternity. What are the temporary things of this world that are holding you captive. Think of that statement that Yahweh makes in Jeremiah. My people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living water, the thing that can truly satisfy, and at the same time of forsaking me, they've, they've dug out cisterns, man-made cisterns. Somebody around here? That's weird. Man-made cisterns. We, we try to do whatever we can to bring satisfaction to our lives. Well, all the while, there's a fountain of living water. There's eternal glory. 
I fear that too many Christians are so content in this world that they might as well have hung a sign in their living room, nay plus ultra. There's no more beyond. I got everything I need right here in my home and in my family. But to paraphrase Lewis again, we're content making mud pies in this weak and inglorious tent that's collapsing around us when what God promises is a permanent habitation at the sea. Something significant. Christians, we must, as Hughes suggests, deepen our understanding of Scripture. Dive deeper into the promises that God has made our hope so that we're not like Ellen who wishes to go to heaven later than sooner, but more like Paul who longs for it today. The glory of eternity, the glory that awaits us in our final glorification. There is plus ultra, more beyond. Believe it. Set your hope in it. Would you bow with me this morning? Do you know the hope of the resurrection? Have you placed your trust in the first fruits of our resurrection, Jesus Christ? He lived for you. He died for you. He rose for you. And today he invites you to put your faith in him. Not in your goodness, not in your works, in him. In him. Jesus follower today, I want to encourage you to look to heaven, to look to the resurrection as the thing that will truly satisfy. There is a glory that awaits that, as we learned last week, is beyond any of our comprehension or measurement. What are the things of the world that are distracting you from seeing it? from a disciple maker perspective. When we're helping other people who are struggling with the burden of this life, they're longing, they're groaning, what are we offering them? Are we offering them the hope of resurrection? Are we offering them the fulfillment of, of salvation? Are we offering them some sad substitute? of the world. I'm going to give you some time now to pray if you're here and you, you would like to pray with somebody. Maybe there's some specific things going on in your life. Maybe you have questions about the resurrection, the hope of Jesus. I would invite you to come forward at this time while everybody's quiet and people are praying. And We'd love to partner you up with someone who will pray with you. But this is a moment of this is a moment of commitment. This is a moment of response to God's word today. Let's use it wisely. Father, forgive me for so often being distracted, trying to find satisfaction in the things of the world. And all that my soul and spirit really want is and need is more of you. So God, help us as we groan and suffer and burden, carry our burdens through this life that to look towards eternity to remember and to share with joy and praise where our true hope lies. And it doesn't lie in the things of this world. It lies in the promise of our own resurrection. And we thank you that you have given us your word that helps us to understand these things builds our faith and I pray that's exactly what it does for each of us today that we leave here with our faith built in this particular area 
that we leave here encouraged, remembering where our true hope lies, and remembering that there is so much more beyond, more beyond. Pray your blessing now. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.